to Discography, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and if you're tuning in for the first time, ask yourself this. Do you think most modern discussions about music lack a certain fire and perspective? If the answer is yes, then welcome home. Please join our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. We're on Instagram and Twitter too, but the Facebook group is home. Home of artists, writers, filmmakers, musicians, you name it. Lots of unbelievably talented sons of bitches in there. My recommendation, <laughs> like what you hear, is to join the group. Then, while you're at it, join up on the rest of the platforms too. Then, please, and I know that's the magic word, rate the podcast five stars along with a beautifully worded review especially if you're on apple or spotify or Podchaser, it'll actually help a lot on whatever platform you call home you will be privy to a never-ending flow of ongoing bonus content giveaways free swag and encouraging words of wisdom on how to never ever give up on your rock and roll dreams of maintaining a lester bangs like perspective deep into adulthood and if you're like me, and enough is just never enough, then you can step in shit, my friends. Visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Our Patreon feed is the last word in deep dive music obsession. There are multiple tiers available at $5, 10 20 30 and $40 a month through which to gain entry to the psychedelically mind-melting music funhouse of Discography's Patreon. Find the most expensive one that's right for you so we can keep this thing owned and operated by us and for us because corporate magazines still suck. Okay, back to the free shit. Don't forget, the link to our legendary playlist is in the show notes and also on our website at discography.com. This is an invaluable resource if, like me and tonight's guest, you just hate listening to shitty songs. Lastly but not leastly, a heartfelt discography thanks goes out to Joe Cravino, Todd Zimmer, and my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, without whose invaluable help and or morale-boosting energy, I'd be 100% dead in the water. I can't thank you enough, especially to my son Mason, who's got a 101-degree fever, and I had to actually blast out at 8.30 a.m. at top speed to make it to my office to do this. I care too much about this show to be easy to deal with, so also, I'm sorry. Okay, back to business. First things first, you guys need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. This guy graffiti's heavily researched, and the music's always reassessed with fresh ears. We're not just covering albums, uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, co-singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and bootlegs. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between zero and five, which allows us all to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. In this episode of Discography, we'll be turning our spray cans on pavement. <sniffs> career contemptuous voices of a Gen X oration turned long game career maintenance experts after the range life whipping boys rolled their various cultural gutter balls one after the other. We are also making history here, folks. It's a discography first. First time we've ever had a second member from the same band on the program. If you look back to episode eight, you can find the venerable Scott Camberg, AKA Spiral Stairs, doing a classic award-winning episode on Roxy Music. <clears throat> Even more importantly though, it's our first episode of The Hot Seat. This is something I've envisioned for a long time, but as you guys already know, musicians normally have such thin skin, which is why we usually have them talk about other bands, but not tonight. And that's because tonight's guest has both distance and wisdom. He also happens to be a member of the band Pavement, as well as a former member of Silver Jews, Pale Horse Riders, Ek Slavia, and Misshapen Lodge. Birthed in Rochester, New York during the Summer of Love, he has what can be deemed an auspicious run-in with two dudes named Stephen Malkmus and David Berman at the University of Virginia. These three Rathscallions soon moved to Jersey City, New Jersey, an area I unfortunately know all too well, and our guest pays his dues as a bus driver and terminal manager in New York City and Hoboken before he can pay his rent. 
It's during this period that Malkmus reunites with longtime bud, friend of the pod, and fellow Roxy Music enthusiast Scott Camberg to kickstart a band called Pavement, which in turn sows the seeds for the Silver Jews. When introduced to the band in 1990, Gesticus McGesterson performs a smattering of functions, namely backing vocals, percussion, harmonica, and keyboards, and I'm guessing prodigious quantities of tea and sympathy as well. He's played on a few Silver Jews records, as well as on recordings by Palace Brothers, Tall Dwarfs, and Pale Horse Riders. He's tour managed Stephen Malkmus and the Jicks, the Frogs, Huggy Bear, and Silver Jews. He currently co-hosts the Three Songs podcast with Mike Hogan, runs Broker's Tip Records, and owns, breeds, and manages a cornucopia of horses. He works as a chart caller for Equibase and reports on various racetracks for the daily racing form as a writer and correspondent. The reason for this seemingly irreconcilable hopscotch and career focus, and I can't stress this enough without even having asked the man if this is actually the case or if I'm just assuming all kinds of shit about him, is that he seems to have adopted a fluid and open outlook on life that's allowed him to assimilate within totally new and dissimilar types of environments, a skill not many in the rock and roll game seem to have picked up along the way, especially Especially not without the gut-wrenching pain of a 20-year bender preceding it, lads and ladies out in the slack-infested regions of Discograffitiville, will you please cause an infernal racket with a percussive object and shout out at the top of your lungs for the one and only Bob Nastanovich. Are you still there, brother? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was a bit concerned about um, when you said that it was sounded to me sounded like Jenna Mason, your wife and son, that it was one person. I thought that was kind of no, no, cool. no, Jen and Mason. If, I thought, that, I thought be, that was kind of like modern. That and, would be cool. then, then I was particularly concerned about um, Mason because I was sick last week. He seems to be all right, just running kind of a how old is the kid? He's three and a half. Bless him. All right. Well, hopefully he um, feels better soon. I appreciate that, man. I was concerned <laughs> about you last week as well. You know, as a longtime follower and obsessive of your band i wanted to come over and uh and and nurse you back to health it's the least i could do for a lifetime of greatness let's talk about horse racing first thank you let's um i appreciate that i appreciate your kindness in that regard you know the stuff where i got really passionate in the intro it really is uh you know very interesting to me that you seem to have i don't know if this was in the cards but you picked up and created a whole new life for yourself and i have a ridiculous amount of respect for that man well you know one great aspect of my experience is that I've always kind of um, been able to do things that I was interested in, um, which is really sort of a very fortunate um, thing. You know, and then, of course, financial need really sort of propels you forward sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, in a lot of ways. Like, you know, you got to keep in mind, like, it's sort of absurd for anybody to expect, especially myself, really, if I look back on when, you know, 30 years ago that I would ever make a living off of being in a band um, that was, you know, that happened for six or seven years. And, and, um, you know, basically um, when that money was gone and I was, you know, to be quite honest, extremely fairly paid, if not overpaid by payment um, from like the mid nineties on. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's very difficult to get jobs in horse racing. Um, so, I'm very fortunate to, I mean, you have to make a living, don't you? You know, I mean, it's very unusual. There are very few, in fact, I think sort of to paraphrase Mark Eibold recently, he's a bartender still at Union Pool in Brooklyn, and Steve West is a stonemason. So, you know, very few people, even well-known people, um, you know, really get to rest on their laurels and not work because of what they accomplished in their band. I mean, right, right. I mean, some of I'm sure oh, many of your favorite artists. And that's a very difficult thing because when the applause stops and the Klieg lights go down and the music's over, um, then you have to get back to the real world. So one good thing about my experience working in horse racing is that nobody in horse racing really even cares about pavement. So it was like a completely right. different world. Like I would say maybe less than 10 people in American horse racing, at least even know who pavement is. And, you know, if we're known anywhere, we're known sort of more by the, uk racing crowd um mm -hmm. because pavement's always been bigger in the uk and and continental europe than 
than the U.S. per capita. Let's just get these two words out of the way so I don't even cool. have to say them anymore. The fall. Okay, now I don't have to say them at all, ever, during the course of this entire interview. Well, I mean, the fall, you know, we're one of hundreds of bands um, that influenced us and then... But it was overemphasized. I mean, it was and it wasn't because there's at least three or four kind of paint-by-numbers ripoffs of fall songs on our first handful of records. Um, and then, of course, people are more well aware of a band like The Fall than Swell Maps, who are equally right. as influential, you know, and then, you know, you got to keep in mind everything pavement. Um, over 90% of it was created and written by Stephen Malkmus, who listens to songs in a just different way than I'm even capable of. When I got to know him in the mid 80s um, and sort of the years pre pavement, we listened to massive amount of music, but he would change his focus all the time. I mean, he was listening to Noi, Fairport Convention, REM, Swell Maps, Can, Incredible String Band. You know, yeah. I mean, like he was yeah, just, I mean, all, all he was the, all over the place. Like he just, you know, whereas yeah. I, I would be completely focused on everything coming out on the amphetamine reptile. Right. You know, he would be like, he would know that genre. And he's just one of those unusually gifted people that could listen to one, like a song once or twice and play it right back to you. So, I mean. So I want to tell you what, what you guys mean to me without getting overly florid about it. Um, you know, I'll get this out of the way quickly. So I believe, you know, if we're going to talk about the voice of a generation, uh, Nirvana, to me, as much as I was a fan uh, of their music and still am, and we did a great episode on those guys a little while back. You know, I graduated college at 22, right when I graduated, you know, advice to the new graduate came out. I felt like you know, we're all neck and neck coming up through this thing. To me, Pavement and Early Beck were the only ones that were voicing what I felt was happening in my life. I can't even tell you, looking back, what I was so caught up with, with regard to slack and career and, you know, being at odds with having a career. Uh, you know, that whole opposition with yourself during that time for desiring success. Where did that or where does that all come from? first of all it sounds like you know you were sort of in the right frame of mind and sort of the correct age group to be a sucker for pavement and early beck and silver shoes so thank you for um falling into that range what was your question again please so you know the idea or the concept of slack all right? oh that was just accidental i think that was just sort of based upon um you know and if you think about the MTV era, which we were all sort of ensconced with from like middle school forward. And there was just kind of this, you know, from being preteens and teens and then going to college, there was just, it seemed like even like really successful people whose careers went awry in the seventies, like sort of household names had to reinvent themselves during the MTV era. And they all just appeared to be trying too hard. I think mm -hmm. it's an aspect of the post like video making era of music. When like David, David Bowie or Bowie, whatever you want to say his name, the let's dance video, that's kind of an embarrassing era for, you know, people that are fans of his discography. And I'm not a completist. I don't, I mean, I only know the hits, but it just seemed way out of character. So um, in a similar fashion to grunge, which is sort of more based on something that actually just kind of happened, sort of your MC five Detroit garage rock, all that, um, you know, it's kind of like reprising that slack without even knowing it was being defined um, was really only kind of presenting yourself as is, as if you were just hanging out um, that you shouldn't really change yourself in every way when it comes into um, quote unquote, walking into the arena to play music. Right, right, I, mean, right. I, mean, I mean, you know, keep in yeah. mind too, that like every single sort of costume, um, every single fat, it, I mean, basically it was style by having no style, uh -huh. you know, essentially. So, and it wasn't, it wasn't much of a challenge because the same things that you would wear every day, if they weren't work uniforms were, became your work uniform. I mean, I, you know, spoiler alert, I, I like every every record you guys have put out. The every, albums are just, or the whole shebang. Specifically, up through and including Crooked Rain, you know, the first half of your career. That's a lot of people like that. 
it, it hits me in a way that um, can explain that time in my life. Uh, cool. and I, I, I feel like if you really want to do an archaeological dig to uncover what Gen X was and what motivated or irked or excited that generation, you couldn't do any better than, well, this podcast, but this batch of tunes. <laughs> So, I mean, you guys are the, are the true voice of my generation. Whether or not you want to accept that mantle, everyone that I know, uh, we, we all feel the same way. It's, you know, it's pavement, early back, you know, some of the early Pollard stuff. Oh, and Lou Barlow. So I'm happy y'all are out there, you know, and obviously, um, yeah, I would be sitting in this chair right now looking forward to, you know, three more unexpected months of playing pavement music for, you know, yourself and your children and nieces and nephews. Um, so, Hey, I'm such a big fan. I bought hospital in 1994 when, when Gary Young released that on something called a compact disc. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have one of those. Yeah. I got, I got my one free copy. Right. Right. So uh, I want to start with a, with a quote here from, uh, from your buddy, Steve. It's always an existential question for Bob being in a band and he feels like I'm not a musician and I never planned on doing this, but he is a musician. He's in pavement and he was a great drummer and a great live presence and a beloved part of the whole thing. He's totally indispensable to what pavement was. He's not featured that much on albums, but as part of the live show, many of our favorite memories from bands are seeing them live and what feeling you got from the people, the smile on Mark's face or the tribal freak out of Bob. Even if you thought I was a dick or lethargic, he was always there and he always gave a thousand percent every show. I don't think we would have gone on that long without him. <clears throat> That's high praise, man. And, you know, I, I put that quote right here because the episode rules for this one, uh, you have to be completely objective and painfully honest for two reasons. A, the aforementioned love from Malkmus is not only very palpable, it's also likely never ending, no matter what you say here, and you know that. And B, he's just relieved that some of the pressure is being taken off of him. <laughs> right, right, right. That's, you know, un very kind of him. Um, yeah, no, you don't have to worry about me being honest. I figured I figured as much, but also in a discography first, I listened to your entire. So I'm very familiar with every song you guys have ever released. That being said, I listened to your entire discography twice just for this episode. Once, I'm sorry. Once a year ago, and then again uh, over the last couple of weeks in an effort to create the ultimate go to source for pavement facts, figures, opinions and entertainment value. So cool. I'm actually going to go totally against the slack thing and i'm doubling up my efforts to go against the grain so let's introduce now the characters in today's episode stephen malkmus on lead vocals and guitar scott camberg spiral stairs guitar backing and lead vocals mark eibold on bass bob on percussion synthesizers vocals uh, probably a slew of other things right bunch of percussion stuff steve west on drums and so, then uh Gary young first of course you know i mean yeah, obviously gary young and i'm not going to forget jason turner on drums as well just in 1989 also rob chamberlain on guitar in 1990 live and, yep and currently rebecca cole right brilliant okay absolutely brilliant and All she's right, taken so a lot of pressure off me because she does a lot of things that i would have always been intended to do and you really don't have the skills to do so she actually makes pavement a more viable live act so i look forward to seeing her she's um elevated us to a different level i can't wait to see you guys i've seen you in 1992 and 2010 where did you see us in 92 i saw you in boston at the avalon oh yeah it oh, was yeah. the greatest rock and roll weekend of my entire life i saw two days in a row on a weekend it was, I believe, you guys opening for My Bloody Valentine. Super uh, Chunk as well, I believe, were on that bill. Yes, I think you're right. And then yeah. the day before or the day after, Sebado and Dinosaur Jr. Oh, that's pretty heavy duty. Yeah, I had yeah. weekends like that that were tremendous. Where it's like, why aren't these incredible things that I love um, have bigger 
gaps of time between them. Uh, yeah, best. <laughs> it's I mean, weird. Yeah. Like Louisville was like that. Like nothing would happen for four months, and then like and not even Derby Week associated. So many things would happen so fast. So I don't. I, okay, so here this is a little segment that I like to call the run up, and the idea here is to get us to the very first release as quickly as possible with an uh, with almost an auctioneer's voice type of a pace to it. So the only Excellent. thing I have here on the run up is that Malcolmus and Canberg had previously pre- performed together in the band Bag of Bones. Uh, Correct. Pavement had it start playing at open mic nights at clubs and bars. There were two local studios that were in Stockton, the cheaper and less professional of which was Ladder Than You Think Studio, Gary Young's, basically his his home. His garage. He was in the Yellow Pages. And they knew Gary. Gary had been in a few kind of legendary hardcore bands in Stockton that they saw when they were teenagers. One of them was called the fall of Christianity. And there's a few other incredibly in, insanely great band names that he was associated. He, like he was pretty well known. He, um, in, in Stockton, if you're a punk rock kid. You know, I like to cut a, a music career up in phases. You guys, I, I figured out that there were, t- uh, for me, two phases. This is the beginning of phase one, the accidental voices of a generation who blanket their A.J. Weberman-worthy messages in static, 1989 to 1994. So Pavement formed in Stockton in 89 as a studio project of uh, Malcolmus and Canberg, known originally only as SM and Spiral Stairs. Uh, their the debut EPs, Very Low Fi, uh, if, uh, if Where You Pick Up is Slanted and Enchanted, this is sort of a running jump into that. And upon first hearing the two guys' songs, uh, Gary Young was quoted as saying, this idiot is a complete songwriting genius. Tell me about SM and Spiral Stairs. These, uh, you know, adopted names. What was the reasoning behind taking the names? I just think, you know, there's a lot of that going on. You know, there's a lot of anonymity and lo-fi music. It was part of the mystery. I mean, there's a lot of people with fake names from the punk rock era and that particular area era of indie rock that was, of course, celebrated by fanzines and... I think that they just, you know, thought that it would be boring to go by their real names. It was sort of define them as these, um, you know, suburban kids from Stockton. And it just, it added to the mystique and pavement was all about mystique. So you're thinking about seven inches going into sort of underground music specialty shops all around the country. And in some cases, the world. And if you pick the record up, um, you don't really you want there to be a huge amount of mystery involved. I mean, like, you know, if you, th- if you think about Thurston Moore, like going through the new releases section at Pure Platters and he sees yeah. this thing and he has no idea what he's buying. And then he sees that the personnel are these two people that don't want themselves identified. Then that just adds to his intrigue, doesn't it? So yeah, with, with, uh, with album covers that are appropriated sort of dartboard versions of old, obscure middle of the road stuff. Right. Right. I mean, just basically it's like young, you know, young adults, trying to be cool you know the thurston moors of the world with as many copies as were being made people like they're basically the target audience were like record collectors that were sort of deep dip um obscure music fans that's all it really was and that's all it really was intended to be just like the early silver cheese stuff so you know obviously when steven and scott started uh they didn't have to hide or play coy because nobody was listening to their music nobody even knew they were making music so they just came up with gnome de plumes but then when everyone started going batshit crazy for the music myself included did it then kind of become something more of a do you know who aj weberman was no so aj weberman was this guy who used to sift through dylan's trash for clues oh okay so when i say aj web aj weberman were the messages it's like you guys were dropping clues and pulling away from the audience to keep people on their toes so imagine that dan koretsky from drag city would have been our weberman guy well okay so he was sifting through looking for all the clues well i mean he's the guy that like you know basically bought sleigh tracks in some probably chicago record store and was very very intrigued and went out of his way to contact us and and i think we were second behind royal trucks um with our release in 1990 of demolition plot j7 and he kind of validated us as you know being worthy of 
uh, being on a tiny little indie rock label and um that's all really i mean it was brilliant i mean it's really all we you know where we wanted to be and then we were able to actually try to become a live band you're not on slay tracks right you, you not on slay tracks i'm not on demolition plot j7 which was released in june of 90 i'm not on perfect sound forever which was released april of 91 i'm not on obviously the summer babe seven inch was august of that year 91 i play a little bit on watery domestic um i don't play at all on slanted enchanted Okay. All right. Let's start with Slay Tracks. Slay Tracks, 1933. I bought Slay Tracks. Actually, I was a college radio DJ in Charlottesville, Virginia. When it came out, it was fourth year at UVA. So I bought it and we played it all the time on college radio. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually have a, an original copy myself uh, that I got at the time. Uh, Slay Tracks, 1933 to 1969. It's an EP. It was recorded during a four hour session on January 17th, 1989 at Gary Young Studio. Radio static and noise are prominently used on the EP, which are techniques very characteristic of that time. I feel like when you guys were ready to uh, lift the, the noise and the static and that was slanted. I love Slay Tracks, man. I really, really love it. Um, I think uh, this is actually the drum stool was kind of passed around here. Gary's on Box Elder and Price, yeah. Uh, Malkmus is drumming on Maybe Maybe, and Malkmus and Camberg are both on She Believes. Uh, so that's sounds kinda, right. So what was it then? It was I, I think Slay Tracks uh, got kicked into a different echelon of of being noticed when the Wedding Present covered Box Elder, right? That was kind of huge for us. I mean, the wedding president at the time were sort of, you know, a mid eighties band. And I guess, um, you know, they bought one of the copies of the record and were sort of intrigued by the catchiest song of the five on this 14 minute EP. And, um, you know, box elder is sort of, you know, widely regarded as one of pavement's most well-known songs. Um, he, Mark Eibold was the, uh, the guy who, who passed it off, right? Oh, is that what it was? I didn't know whether they bought their own. Yes. I'm, I know that Mark definitely <clears throat> knew David Gedge and, um, and, and see Mark also, Mark would have been in that group too. Um, in fact, we lived in New York. Mark for... apparently gave it to Keith Gregory. Oh yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. Cause he was in a band called dust devils at the time. And so they, he would have been amazing. in that. Amazing. Yeah, he would have been in that same group. They had a record on Teen Beat that was so good, man. Yeah, I think they, yeah, no, I mean, and they were very good live. I actually have more experience with seeing them live. But, you know, um, Stephen, you know, lived in New York City and went to the same shows as Mark for over a year before Mark knew that he was the guy from Pavement. I think, you know, mm -hmm. by the time Mark figured that out, that he sort of had been in the same vicinity as, um, you know, this guy that was putting out his favorite obscure seven inches. Um, and then of course, perfect sound forever, which was a 10 inch. We'd seen him dozens of times because at all the same shows, whether there's five people in the house or 200 and he was just kind of a fixture on the scene. He could, his mind was blown when he, when he figured out that we were, and I think he f didn't figure it out until we played, in new york in 1990 when we just played like six or seven shows what exactly is the the songwriting split here because the credit for the entire ep reads all tracks written by steve malkmus and scott camberg were they really co-writes you think i wouldn't know um i would assume <laughs> that um there was no ego involved or concern about income and um it was interesting they could have easily said all tracks were written by payment, which would have probably been more accurate. Um, but as you mentioned that, um, you know, Gary sort of only drummed on the thing because he thought what they were doing was kind of weird and cool. And he's like, Hey, I can play drums on this and make it better. So he probably like instantly recognized a couple of songs where he could like improve them with his sort of wizardly kind of Keith Moon esque drumming style. And um, although that doesn't really come out until we later in the band, um, you know, I mean, I think that that's probably fair. I think that in terms of the songwriting credits, there's five songs on this thing. I think three of them are just classics. Uh, you're killing me kicks the thing off, uh, the static and that completely insane Malcolm solo toward the end 
Always one of my favorites he ever laid to tape. Pretty cool. This is one of my more highly rated pavement songs, I'd say, actually. Box Elder, right there from the get-go. You get the sweet tunefulness of almost like a 1910 Fruit Gum Company thing. I mean, he, this guy, even though he obviously loves punk music and all of the notions and aesthetics that go along with it, he obviously knows how to write a catchy song. When I say he, it could be he and Scott. I really don't know, but this is a very, very catchy song. Um, definitely not hiding behind the static. No, uh, yeah, both of them. This is definitely... I mean, you know, these guys, um, you know, sure, they would like to consider themselves punk, but they were really more had sort of pop sensibilities all the way through. And they just, you know, but they were also sort of weird. So it was always yeah. completely a blend. And then like, you know, Maybe Maybe, which is the third song on it, is very frenetic. And actually, we practiced that to play in 2022. No um, shit, Really? And, um, yeah, just cause like, you know, we've got so many mellow songs now and, um, you know, we want to play songs with a bit more pace. Um, so, you know, you might hear it a few times and I think she believes, which was sort of had kind of more of an anthemic quality, which is the, she believes is fucking yeah. I love, she believes and here, I believe that this is a path that was not not quite taken. I don't know if it was just playing at this, but this is much more uh, dark. And then the chug of the guitars when it kicks in has a very demonic vibe to it. Um, and the lyrics are fucking incredible, Ni almost nihilistic. And I don't see that or hear it reflected back in any of the of, of the rest of Pavement's output. Really? That's cool. I yeah, mean, not really. I think it's a one-off and I, I love She Believes. It was intense to play it live and um i'm not really sure why it got retired i mean it's so easy to play i guess it could pop up kind of any time um i mean just the way he's like singing about she believes that i'm free of disease it, the, you yeah. know just fucking with someone's mind it, it's a really interesting song there's nothing nothing else that uh that really reflects that that kind of spirit and all the rest of it and the the stomp of the vibe has a golem like thing to it that's really interesting it was one of the first songs that I would have played on where I felt that it was cool for me to be in the band because it was actually made a little bit better by kind of a double drum yeah. tribal sort of thing. So, yeah, no, it's, it's always been near and dear to me, but I loved it. You know, the first time I listened to the record, if, you know, a few months after the record came out. Um, this is my favorite on the EP. And Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a pretty good 14-minute seven inch that I'm, i think probably originally cost 2.99 i mean i mean price yeah it is probably the most forgettable song on it i don't uh, you know out of five stars i give this four and three quarters stars what do you give this one five for what it was i mean you know there's no doubt about it for me i mean it was it's hard amazing. to argue with that it's a look it's a it's a great piece of work mm -hmm. um and i remember the feeling before slanted was out of there's this really exciting band that's doing this crazy shit and the songs are great but you have to like pierce through the static to hear it and i remember my friends were all talking about it and you had to hunt them down in shops and it was you know i'm talking like we, i probably discovered you guys were like right before slanted came out so it was that time of like anything can happen with these guys so then june 1st 1990 Demolition Plot J7 comes out. That's their, your second EP. Recorded October 16th and 17th, 1989. It's obviously done by the same people in the same spirit. However, I would say that uh, if Slay Tracks was the sound of a slab of concrete hitting the ground in a statement kind of way, these are like doodles in the margins, but there's nothing wrong with doodles. Uh, this one is just more playing around. It's less of a focus on songcraft. It actually has sort of a William Burroughs beatnik spoken word tossed off quality to it. Not, not, I don't mean that in a bad way, but they're more like pieces. Basically, the sort of ethic and the goal was rather similar to um, Slay Tracks. Um, and I think it was just like Scott and Steven's minds were sort of blown by the favorable reaction and the reviews that they got for their first record, which were in all kinds of fanzines. and Right you know, other whatever people who were, you know, tastemakers for the obscure back then. And so, you know, there wasn't any pressure on, but 
I um, mean, I guess sort of the biggest compliment they would have received at the time was and one of the beautiful things about a lot of the things that Pavement did is that at, sort of at the same time that Slate Tracks was going on, that Dan Koretsky and Dan Osborne were forming Drag City and and Slate Tracks was on their radar. So, you know, I mean, obviously it was a very unofficial deal but dan said uh, if you if you make anything else we'll put it out on drag city so i think they kind of you know pretty quickly got together and obviously you know again in similar fashion that all tracks were written by stephen and scott well this actually uh, had a different gestation period because uh most of the songs on this one were written while uh, Scott and Jason Fox were in PA, which was a short-lived band. And then Stephen heard the demos recorded by them, and it's turned into a pavement project. Yeah. I mean, I never heard of that band um, or any, I, don't, I mean, I'll keep in mind, I, I would have been um, not around. Um, I didn't actually, I had never met Scott. I met Scott after this was released um, about, you know, five to 10 days before we ever played a live show. And, um, you know, because I, I didn't, I, I was just supposed to be in pavement to be the band's first roadie. I had a crappy LeBaron station wagon, which we could fit all the gear in. And, um, and Steven said, well, our drummer is, you know, this guy is like 15 years older than us. That's, you know, pretty heavy drinker. And I, I need somebody in addition. I mean, I really help. I really appreciate you providing your car, but um, I need you to also like buy a floor tom and a snare and um, <laughs> and and sort of keep time if he's too in- incoherent to to do his job. Um, so and then you know so you know basically I kind of found out that I was going to be a part of this in the live show, you know, less than five days before our first show. Um, of you know I bought Slay Tracks. Um, when it came out, um, you know, uh, and, um, you know, forklift was sort of a, um, you know, if it, by payment standards at the time it was a very poppy song, spizzle trunks, another song that we practiced to play live in 2022. Forklift is great, by the way. I love the, all the, you know, the ba 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 beach boys backing vocals, all that stuff is genius too. I think that's kind of what made it cool. I mean, um, because otherwise it sounds sort of like a lo-fi version of a lot of things that were right. popular at the time it was just lo-fiing it i mean this would probably be i mean the fall would be amongst a hundred influences for a song like this um it just sounded like a lot of quote unquote alternative rock from the era but kind of put through the pavement sieve and kind of yeah, yeah. you know stamped by not only the songwriters, but also by the low grade studio and um, the vibe and sort of just the complete under the radarness of all of it, you know. Some of these songs feel like um, uh, you you guys are just kind of improving in the studio and having fun. Uh, but then there's a couple tunes. Forklift is one of them, but then even more so internal K Dart and especially Perfect Depth. Uh, which is to me is the classic from this record. Um, those are really and truly pavement songs that are transferable. I think. Yeah, no, I think that that's more than correct. And I think you know, the you know, recorder grot, recorder grot, grot rally were just kind of like noise scapes to they're sort of kind of breathers between songs to yeah yeah continue the to ensure to the um to the noise lovers out there that pavement were still very much a band that made little noise ditties. Okay. So, I mean, you know, that, that, that was the whole game plan. It was like, get this little recipe of weirdness and, you know, you want to show every side of where the band was, um, and when they were making this in 1989. Right. And then, you know, when 1991 rolls around with perfect sound forever, now it's starting to feel like this thing is being integrated. It's not just like, all right, let's give a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, doodles for the weirdos and pop tunes for the, you know, the, the kids who love the, you know, chart songs. 
Perfect Sound Forever feels more integrated to me. Uh, songs like Angel Carver Blues, Mellow Jazz Dosen, uh, that is amazing. From Now On is amazing. I remember seeing you guys do Debris Slide at the Avalon. That's an absolute classic, and Home is a classic. Mm -hmm. um, some really good stuff on Perfect Sound Forever. I mean, you know. Oh, wait, wait. Before we go on, I'm sorry. I give Demolition Plot J7, I give that three stars. I'll give it four, just because of its significance as a stepping stone. And I mean, it didn't have the intense impact as Slay Tracks, but it was a very logical stepping stone and progression from one thing to the next. Definitely. For, for a very obscure band. Yeah, I mean, if it had completely sucked, then it might have stopped that progression. Anything bad, which is amazing. Uh, no, no, there's plenty of bad. And there's bad on... I don't think so. I'm curious. There's bad on everything, basically. Some things are better than others, but I don't, I don't hear a, a very much bad. But, you know, a lot of the readily discardable things um, were put on there intentionally. Huh. Okay. For example, you know, things like Drive by Fader and Krell Vid User from the record we're, we're about right. to talk about. I mean, they were just there to be there. That's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But Add then, to the mystique, you know, it was just kind of hocus pocus. Did you guys you know, smoke of, as much weed as I, as I imagine you guys smoked back then and uh, how much weed that I smoked? Even back if we did, the weed was of such low quality, it wouldn't have made any impact at all. It was approachable and I yeah. it far more welcome than this in insane stuff they sell today. It's like which, PCP crossed with acid now. I don't know what it is. I, I, it's over my head. Okay, so Perfect Sound Forever, uh, I believe, picks up where Slay Tracks left off. Um, you know, it's fantastic. This is, uh, again, you, there's a couple songs that are, you know, less songs than interstitial tracks, but the actual song songs that are on here uh, are really top shelf. And I remember, you know, certainly at the time, thinking that Debris Slide very easily could have fitted on Slanted and Enchanted. Same with a few other songs on this. Uh, I give this one five stars. Perfect Sound Forever? Yeah. Oh, I mean, for, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a very significant step in kind of your reality as a band to go from seven inches to ten. Um, Perfect Sound Forever was our, you know, kind of real label experience, first real label experience, because, you know, Slate Track was self-released by scott you know and this, so this kind of cemented you know and you know keep in mind drag city um was also you know making strides as you know in sort of obscure label significance which was a big deal in the 80s and 90s and um you know this song actually sort of set us up for being in the position to have 10 or 12 songs to actually even conceive or think of playing live shows i mean what's when that the first live show august of 90 so okay um this was released actually but, but after we had played live but it was recorded about eight months before we played live because of you know timing and stuff like that there's a pretty big gap between the recording of it and the release nearly a year and a half yeah you guys are a band now for three years um when when summer the summer babe single came out you'd been to well not officially a band but but releasing music as pavement for three years i mean we really didn't officially become a band until we until after Slane and Shannon came out when we went toward Slane and Shannon. I mean, that was sort of the reality mark. It was just completely a project and then go resume your normal life after the right. project. So in including the first two less than 10 day live tours. Well, those were just taken. They, those, those tours were on um, everybody in the band taking vacations from their jobs at once to do something else there's one song in particular on the summer babe single that i am that i have always been very enamored with oh, did I, are we doing with perfect sound forever oh we can talk more about it yeah i'll run through it real quick heckler heckler spray is a brilliant live show starting song it still gets used and has been used many times in medley with 
in the mouth of the desert because they naturally just go right into the other, which is a song we'll talk about later from Santa and Enchanted. Um, from now on, it's a very groovy pop song that was always cool to play live. We probably call from more on this record than any other, and that's Velvet Underground. Mm-hmm. I mean, Home as well. Um, Debris Slide is, you know, pavement favorite. Home um, is another one that will be played in 2023. Um, I love those early, um, those anthemic flag wavers that you guys did back at the time. And they're short and sweet too, you know, so like, you know, they're kind of, um, you know, for the old guard pavement fans. And, you know, I mean, I loved playing Angel Carver Blues, the Mellow Jazz Dosen. I mean, this to me is a five. I mean, this is essential pavement record. Everything about the product is fantastic. The artwork, the 10 inchness of it. It's actually the shortest of the three early pavement records in terms you know, of time. Very, what's very funny is that, you know, I remember at the time uh, reading all this stuff about how you have no, you guys had no idea how you found yourself in a band with a, with a drummer that was in love with Prague, but yet your song titles are so Prague like, even though. They're well, just- I mean, you know, Stephen was really into German Prague and Gary would have had nothing to do with song naming or record naming. Right. Um, but spiritually, um, you know, I think that Gary was so into like things like King Crimson and Frank Zappa and yes, that Stephen actually, he would kind of force feed Stephen. I don't really know how much patience Scott would have had for it, but, um, he would force feed and show, um, Stephen sort of the brilliance of those bands and, you know, many other bands from the same genre. So, you know, you know, again, like, Steven as a songwriter and as a guitar player listens to music differently than you and I would. So I don't really know what's right. seeping into his creative process when he listens to something. You what, you give this five stars, right? I can't imagine. Yeah. Okay. So in 92, the first release is the Summer Babe single. You know, we could talk about Summer Babe when we get to Slanted, but I especially want to talk about the B-sides. Uh-huh. Mercy Snack, The Laundromat, which I, mm. I was never a huge fan of that song. There's a strain of songwriting uh, that steven seems to enjoy engaging in here and there and i call it his weird owl side it's like (laughs) i feel like without pavement there to keep him in check he's more apt to give in to some of these impulses like his first solo album they're all over the place and i'll point it out on like upcoming stuff but i don't know if he listens to weird owl but there's this (laughs) sort of novelty tune vibe to some of the work he does and it, it the first time i ever notice it is in mercy snack i mean it's interesting that that would be your angle on it i would just look at it as attempts at self-amusement on his part and therefore you know we're always happy to see him enjoy his own sense of humor i think at all times he's trying to you know sort of challenge himself and really from the start of the band he sort of in his own way appreciated the essential versus the sort of more off the cuff or discardable. And um, he wanted to include them all until it came to album making time. So, you know, a song like Mercy Snack is a song like millions of bands, B-sides and sort of Baptist Black Tick. The other thing on here um, would have obviously fit on Demolition Plot or Perfect Sound Forever. And for all I know, there might have been passes at it during those previously released records and it was had just ended up on the cutting room floor so it was this is amazing yeah no it's a very good um, punk rock song and it was very fun to play live and it's got really cool guitar in it and um yeah no so it it would fall into a group of one of pavement's better b-sides but this was also sort of a change of pace too because this was the first single that we released that was instead of being like an ep this was a proper single like a seven inch it's supposed to be like that you know you bought from the time that you were in fifth grade in my case um you know this is clearly an a side with two shorter b sides thrown on it which was right. kind of the way it went in um punk rock yeah, it was recorded right before we went on tour for the second time in the summer i'm sorry released it was released then i'm not actually sure when it was recorded to be honest with you but it, i remember that was like the 
the leaves of it coincided with the second little set of tour dates that we ever played. And, you know, these were all in the Northeast corridor, like going down to the mid Atlantic area. They're very right. brief tours. Um, That's yeah, probably I mean, this, when I saw you, I'm guessing. I mean, just because of the significance of summer babe um, and raising us, you know, sort of the first for lack of a better term, kind of proper hit songs um, that we ever had. Um, that sort of, you know, kind of by anybody who pays any attention to pavement consider sort of an essential song. I would give this a five as well, but um, and because even Mercy Snack, which is clearly its weakest thing on it, um, was just a continued um, continuation of, of something that has always been on these pavement records. And it's just like, take a breather before you hit you with the next cool thing. I mean, for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to rate these songs separately. I'm going to give Baptist Black Tick a five. And uh, Mercy Snack, I, I'm going to give uh, two and a half. It's just mm -hmm. not my cup of tea, really, but um, not that I don't like it. It's, uh, I just am sitting there. I, I have all these such great memories of driving around Harvard Square when I was going to Boston University in the early 90s. Uh, terrier, terrier. <laughs> I, with my good friend Brett Becker driving around, uh, we probably would have been with Mary Lou Lord as well during that time. We we're close mm -hmm. with her. I know her. And just screaming, that fucker! Ah! Just, uh, yeah, I am. Great memories, it was, man. It was pretty intense, Baptist Black Tick. Um, yeah. I think, you know, Mercy Snack would be a song that was never supposed to be rated. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, and yeah. I'm the douche that comes along. and but That's you okay. Know, you know, I'm, I'm a completist, that's all. Lots of our fans are douches. <laughs> and on that note, this has been episode one, The Road to Slanted. Catch us next week for part two, Slanted and Enchanted on Discography. Discography.